Hey, good morning, church family. We're so thankful that you joined us for our online ser service this morning. Uh, if you're new with us this morning, this is your first time checking out our church. Uh, we have some tabs up there and we'd love to serve you. And so you can just hit that connect tab. We'd love to connect with you at some point this week. There's also a few other things there that will help us to serve you. If you need any care in any way, uh, then you can just push that care tab and fill out the form there. And we have a team of people that would love to help you if you're finding yourself in any trouble because of the circumstances and the pandemic that we're in right now. We'd also love to pray for you, our staff and our elders and, and our church. We love prayer and so we'd love to pray for you this week. And so there's a prayer tab at the top there. You can fill out a prayer request and we'd love to lift up that request to the Lord throughout the week. There's also a giving tab. And, and as, as we continue to worship the Lord as a church together, we wanna ensure that we're continuing to give to the Lord's work and seeing him accomplish his work uh, for his kingdom, for his glory. So be sure to hit that tab. We're thankful that you joined us this morning. We know that this is weird. We know that this is not normal. And in many ways, we don't wanna get used to this. It should be weird that you're at home right now, uh, sitting, watching, an online service in your pajamas. We don't want another pajama day at church ever again. And so this is weird and yet I'm reminded that there are some things that are always going to be the same. And one of those things is that God is always gracious. God is always wanting to meet with us. And so we are trusting that God is gonna use this time as we as a church, we all log on at the same time. It's so weird and yet we know this, God wants to meet with us. I was reminded of Paul writing to Titus and he's writing about how the salvation has appeared in Jesus Christ and he says this because of our salvation in Titus chapter 3 verse 7 he says that so so that being justified by his grace we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life listen because justification has come in Jesus Christ we have all the grace of God and because we have the grace of God, we have a foundation of hope. And so let's stand now and worship our King. Let's sing our hearts out because he has poured out his grace on us, grace upon grace. Well, good morning, church. I hope you're excited to worship the Lord this morning and to give him praise for all that he has done for you. Let's sing this familiar song of God's amazing grace. We sing, who breaks the power? Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder? Who leaves us breathless? In awe and wonder, the King of glory, the King above all kings. So we say, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. you've done for me. Hey. Who brings our chaos? Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of glory, who rules the nations with truth and justice. Shines like the sun. 
is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King.
Church, it's good to see you. Uh, wish we could see each of your faces and uh, once again be reunited together. Uh, we believe in the sovereignty of God, that he's on the throne, that all things right now are completely and fully in his hands and we have no fear. And it's good to be reminded of that, even in that last song that we sung this morning as a church. I want to read for us Romans 8, 28, the passage we're all familiar with. The word of God says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Let's just pray this uh, to the Lord right now as you're in your living rooms, family rooms, in front of your screens. And uh, let's lift up our hearts to the Lord. Father, we approach you with reverence, with awe, and with amazement, Lord, that you are indeed sovereign. It's hard for us to put our minds around the fact, Lord, that all the details of this world are completely and fully under control by you. God, we have peace in your sovereignty. We have peace in your plans. And God, we know that you indeed are good, that the way in which you rule is always good. And Lord, our hearts are so uh, driven by the storms of this life, by the circumstances of this life, and so often, Lord, we find our faith failing. So we look to you this morning, Lord. Uh, we thank you for who you are. We confess, Lord, that this week, through the circumstances we found ourselves in, many, many ways, Lord, we failed you this week in seeing your goodness and seeing your sovereignty of taking things into our own hands. And Lord, we just confess to you our, our selfishness, our self-centeredness, our anxiety, our fear. And Lord, in the ways that we demonstrated to you this week, faithlessness. God, we pray that you, even in this time, as we gather together, supernaturally and powerfully, Lord, that you would strengthen our hearts, that you would lift up our eyes so that we would be able to see you indeed on the throne. Give us, Lord, bold confidence in Jesus Christ. Give us confidence, Lord, in your good purposes and your plans towards us. God, this week would we be used by you. And we ask this now in your name. Amen. Well, we're looking forward to introducing a new song to you this morning, church. Uh, this song is called Waymaker. And in this season that we find ourselves in, I think many people are wondering and asking of the Lord, Lord, how are you bringing about your providence, your purposes in the midst of this chaotic season that we find ourselves in? And this song reminds us that even as we look to the Old Testament, we see a God who is in control, who is always bringing about his purposes and his plan of redemption, even though we may not understand all the details. And so this morning, we want to sing this song that reminds us that our God is a keeper of his promises that he makes a way for his people and his plan. And that even in this season that we find ourselves in, we can believe and have hope that our God is a God who is accomplishing all that he wills. I pray that this is an encouragement to your soul as you're reminded of God's character in this song. And invite you, as, as you learn the melody and the lyrics, would you sing along with us and worship the Lord from where you are today?
God, that is who you are. We make miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. And even when, even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. join me in prayer. Father in heaven, we're so thankful for who you are. We're so thankful, Lord, that you are a faithful God, that you are so good to your children. And Lord, we bow before you now in humble recognition of that reality. And God's so grateful to be able to declare you as king, to praise you this morning, to lift our voices and declare your great worth. God, we love you. And Father, we pray that you are well pleased with the worship that we have offered to you this morning. We pray that our hearts would be filled, Lord, with awe and adoration of you. And Lord, now as we come to your word, we just confess, God, our great need of you. We need your spirit. Holy Spirit, would you move amongst us? Would you, Lord, drive your word into our heart, open our eyes that we might behold the wonderful truths of your law? Father, would you change us and transform us by your word and by your spirit this morning. We submit ourselves to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, church. It's good to be together this morning. Good to be diving into the book of Ruth. So if you have your Bibles with you, I hope you've already opened them up to the book of Ruth. If you're joining us maybe and you're new and you're not quite sure, uh, where we're going. We're diving in, as I said, to the book of Ruth, and here's, here's how you can get there. It's really close to the beginning of your Bible. Um, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth. Now, Ruth is a very small book. It's only four chapters long, so if you get into First or Second Samuel, you've gone too far. Uh, you can go right past it. So get yourself situated in Ruth, and as you're doing that, I just want to uh, maybe address a universal axiom, a, a universal truth. I think this is universally true. You can test this out later maybe with your kids. Um, I think every kid is afraid of the dark. I mean like the pitch blackness dark. I think that's almost universally true, that at least early on in our lives, every one of us are afraid of the dark. And many of us, though maybe we're struggling to admit it right now, are actually even as grown men and women afraid of the dark still. Um, not many of us like going down into a dark, cold basement with no lights on. And I, I think that makes a lot of sense. You see, darkness is essentially the absence of light. 
And darkness has a way of, of creating confusion in our hearts and in our minds. It has a way of unsettling us because in the dark, we can't see what's in front of us. In the dark, we are uncertain sometimes of what's around us. You see, darkness has a way of stripping us of confidence, of comfort, of peace and security. Darkness is in many ways scary. And the reality is that many of us are going to experience darkness in life. In fact, every single one of us will experience darkness in this life, not just physical darkness. I mean the darkness of tragedy and sorrow, the darkness of suffering and despair, a darkness that can sometimes quickly overwhelm us, a darkness that can cause us to begin to ask really hard questions and begin to even cause us to wrestle with God, a darkness that can in many ways not just cause a a crisis of faith, but can in many ways cripple some of our faiths. This kind of darkness is something that we will all inevitably experience in this life. A darkness where we often feel alone and insecure, where we lack confidence and clarity, where we cannot see the way forward, where we begin to to wonder if God is even present with us. We begin to wonder if, if the darkness is ever going to end, if we're ever going to be able to see even just a little glimmer of light. The question for us as we look at the book of Ruth this morning is how do we navigate the darkness? When everything feels like it's collapsing in upon us, when all we can see is darkness, how do we navigate in the midst of darkness? The story here begins with darkness. This first chapter is filled with darkness, darkness nationally, darkness spiritually, and darkness personally and intimately in the life of a woman who's not named Ruth, but named Naomi. The story begins with this woman named Naomi, and her name actually means pleasant one. But as we'll see as we begin this first chapter, there's nothing pleasant about her life in this moment. All she sees is darkness. All she experiences is tragedy and chaos. This story that will be about a woman named Ruth begins with this woman, Naomi. And as this story unfolds, we'll see that it's a story that, yes, begins with ruin, but will end in redemption. It's a story that begins with sorrow, but it will end ultimately in salvation. It's a story that starts, yes, with deep darkness, but will end, thankfully, with blazing light. This is a story that is filled, yes, with tragedy, but it's a story that's filled with so much hope. And I think this story will meet us in powerful ways, especially as we look at our present circumstances. It's a story we believe God is going to use to speak into the very depths of our of our hearts because you see ultimately the story is not about Ruth and it's not ultimately about Naomi this is a story where the main player the key figure is God himself in this story even in the midst of the darkness God is working silently in the background God is working sovereignly in the background, even in the midst of darkness and tragedy. And he's working to to bring all things together into this beautiful plan of light and life. We're going to see many themes throughout the book of Ruth. Many different themes of, of kindness of graciousness, of God, of love and loyalty. We're going to see themes of community and redemption. But here at the beginning, we need to see that this story begins with tragedy and darkness. Here, the book of Ruth begins this way in verse 1. You can follow along with me. It says, In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. And a man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab. He and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilian. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died. 
and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpah and the name of the other Ruth. They lived there about 10 years and both Malon and Killian died so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. We all experience darkness in life and learning to navigate the darkness is crucial to being able to survive and to thrive spiritually in this life. And you see, the darkness in life so often forces us to see things that we can't readily see, to pay attention to things, to be aware of things that we're going to face. And first, what we see in this text is this, that darkness in life forces us to see the tensions that lead to temptation. The tension we experience through the circumstances of life often force us to experience greater temptation towards sin and rebellion against God. And that's what we see at the beginning of this book. We're told that actually uh, Naomi and her husband, their life is filled with, with tension, with, with the circumstances they find themselves in. And at a first glance, it appears that these circumstances are just almost random but what we see as we look closely at the Word of God is that these circumstances are not random at all. The tension they're experiencing is tension that has been brought about by God because of sinful human beings. But right here in this moment, Naomi and Elimelech and their two sons, Malon and Killian, are experiencing immense strain in their lives. They, they're almost like a rubber band that's being stretched to the point of almost snapping. That's almost where they're at. Or, or as Bilbo Baggins once said to Gandalf, he felt thin like butter stretched across too much bread. Which is such a fitting illustration, by the way, because we find out that this family is from the little town of Bethlehem, the same town uh, of Jesus Christ himself. And it's a fitting illustration because the name Bethlehem literally means bread basket. It is the place of bread. But what's so ironic here is that the place of bread has no bread. In fact, there's no food at all. The tension they're experiencing is, is a famine that swept across the nation of Israel. They're supposed to live in the house of bread. Meanwhile, they're looking for food to survive. And we know why this is happening. Like I said, this actually isn't hidden from us. The author here of Ruth tells us why this is happening. And, and we get a glimpse of that in the, just the very first few words. He says this, that they're living in the days when the judges ruled. Now, if you know anything about a biblical history, in the timeline of the Bible, you know this, the, the judges ruled around the time of 1200 BC to 1020 BC. And if you know your biblical history, what you know is this, that this is the time of Joshua, when the people were entering into the promised land, all the way up to the point of Saul, who is the first official king in Israel. The book of Judges indicates that this is a time of both religious and social insanity. It's a time that is filled with chaos. And in fact, the book of Judges tells us that here's what characterized the people of God. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. It was a time that was filled with injustice and oppression and immorality. And there was a vicious cycle that characterizes this time. It's actually called the, the cycle of apostasy that's seen about seven times throughout the book of Judges. The cycle of apostasy looks something like this. The people of God were living and, uh, in obedience to God, but eventually they fall into sin and idolatry. They turn their back on God, they rebel against God, and as a result, Israel is then oppressed as judgment from God's hand. Uh, their enemies raise up uh, against them and begin to oppress them and take control of them. Eventually, the people of God call out, they cry out to the Lord in repentance, and they ask for God's forgiveness and mercy, and God is so faithful. He raises up a judge from amongst them, a, a tribal chief from amongst the people of God, who then goes to war against Israel's enemies and delivers Israel. 
And after the deliverance of God's people, there's peace as they've turned back to the Lord. But eventually that judge dies and the people of God in their freedom turn their back on God again. And round and round we go in this cycle of apostasy. But you see, this explains why the people of God uh, and the land of Israel is experiencing famine at this point. You see, they're living at a time when the people of God have turned their back against God. You say, well, how do we know that? Well, the word of God tells us what God promised he would do if God's people were faithful and what he would do if God's people were unfaithful to him and to the law of God. In the book of Leviticus, as God gave the people the law, look at what he says to them here. God promised, listen, in Leviticus, he promised that if they obeyed the law, they would be blessed. That the land would be fruitful, there would be abundance in the land, they would dwell in security and safety. God promised blessing for obedience, but he promised, listen, curses for disobedience. And the curses were manifold, but I want you to see this. One of the curses seen here in Leviticus um, 26, verse 18, is this, just follow right here, and your strength shall be spent in vain, for your land shall not yield its increase, and the trees of the land shall not yield their fruit. In other words, if you're disobedient to my law, here's one of the consequences, you're going to experience famine in the land. And this is exactly what we see here. They had chosen to disregard God's word. And they experienced great famine in the land. And by the way, this was reiterated, the same truth was reiterated in Deuteronomy chapter 28. And, it's, and it, that's even almost more powerful because Deuteronomy, the book of Deuteronomy, is a, a sermon preached by Moses. After the unfaithful generation, the wilderness generation died off, the new generation that was going to enter into the promised land, they're on the, the, the brinks of entering into the promised land. They're standing on the, 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 the edge of the Jordan River, and Moses stands up, and he preaches to them the book of Deuteronomy. That's his sermon to them, preparing them for life in the land, the promised land of God, where they were to experience God's blessing if they were obedient. And in Deuteronomy chapter 28, God warns them through the mouth of Moses again, Again and says, listen, if you're unfaithful, if you disobey me, if you rebel against me, if you serve other gods, you will experience many things, and one of those things is going to be famine. Famine in the land. It's their sin that has put them in this predicament. But it's how they respond that is the biggest issue here. They're experiencing hardship and famine. So look at what they do. It says in the text that they set out as sojourners. They went to sojourn in the country of Moab. In other words, follow this. They're leaving their own country. They're leaving their land. And they're setting out for Moab to find food there. They believe, listen, that that's where they're going to find food and sustenance and life and health. You see, was this okay for them to do? Here's the biblical answer. No, no, not at all. No, they're actually turning their back on God and they're turning toward the enemy. We know this from God's word that his design was that his people live in the land, that they stay in the land. It was the land that he had promised to them. He had made a covenant with his people and his design for his covenant people was to live in the promised land. And if the land did suffer, the word of God told them that that was because of their unfaithfulness to God. And the answer was not to turn away from God and to leave the land. It was to turn back to God. It was to humble themselves with brokenness and contrition and to, to call out to God for deliverance. And yet what we see here is that's not what Elimelech does. Elimelech, whose name literally means God is king, turns his back on the king and runs from the land of the king. I want to ask you this as you consider this true story in the history of Israel and God's people. When you experience tension in your life, where do you turn? In the midst of difficult circumstances, when there's darkness all around you, when there's confusion, when there's uncertainty and instability, where is it that you turn? What do you look to to find life, to find sustenance, to find joy and satisfaction? 
the scary reality for every one of us is that instead of turning to God, we can quickly turn away from God towards other God substitutes. And what's scary here is that Elimelech knew the word of God. He had access to the word of God, and yet he still chose to disregard God's word. And the irony here is unbelievable. You see, he doesn't just turn away from God. It's where he turns that's so significant. He turns to Moab. Moab was historically the enemy of Israel. Moab has their roots, their beginnings in the incestuous relationship with Lot and his daughter. Moab is cursed by God because of their refusal to aid the nation of Israel as they were led out of slavery and into the wilderness. Moab is repeatedly established as the enemy of God's people. And yet what we see is that this is exactly where Elimelech leads his family in this moment of tension, in this moment of crisis. He runs straight into the land of the enemy, straight into sin. They leave the promised land. They turn their back on God. And you see, the greatest tragedy in this story is not the famine that they're experiencing. It's where they turn in the face of this famine. We often grow weary, don't we, in obeying the commands of God? We think it's hard. It's so challenging to obey God and to put his word into practice in our lives. And we look at our circumstances and we begin to believe that the the best way out is, is probably the easiest way out. We push aside God's words and God's commands, and we simply do what we should not do. We simply choose to do what is right in our own eyes, rather than trusting God and His Word. You know, it's hard to follow God's Word when it's inconvenient, isn't it? I mean, let's be honest, it's really hard to follow God's Word even when it is convenient. Even when it's easy, when life is good, it's hard to follow God's word. The passions of our flesh wage war within us. The sin bent of our human heart is so strong. Really, this is a a picture in this story of all creation that has turned their back on God in rebellion against God as king. And again, the irony is that the house of bread is facing famine because of disobedience. The one whose name means God is king refuses to submit to God as king. And yet I want to encourage you, this could be be so important for you today. You may be facing a lot of tension in your life, and you may be facing the temptations that come because of the, the pressure cooker you feel that you're in. And right now, you may be tempted to turn your back away from God and to do what's simply right in your own eyes. And God's word is calling you away from the, the edge, from the precipice. And he's calling you back to turn and to gaze upon him and see that his ways are better. You see, here's what we need to do when we face this kind of tension that leads to temptation. Here's how they should have responded. First, they should have responded with fear. This is how we ought to respond, fear of God. We should respond by putting the fear of God before us. In other words, we should look and see, God, your glory is of the utmost importance in my life. We should rise every single day and begin our day by saying, God, this day is your day. I am yours. I live for your glory, not my glory. Your will be done, not my will be done. You see, when we live with the fear of God ever before us, it becomes our desire to please God in every way. We ought to respond not only with the fear of God, but with faith in God especially in the midst of tension, in the midst of the darkness that we experience in life. God is testing our faith. We know this all throughout the New Testament and the Old Testament. We see this. We're taught this, that God is is asking us this question. When everything gets hard and challenging, will you continue to put your faith and trust in me? And what we see is this, that so often we will devise our own plan of escape. We'll come up with human wisdom that we believe is better than God's wisdom. It's crazy. God had told them how to respond. He had given them his word that gave clear directions on how they were to respond in difficult times. And yet they refused. How often do we refuse to run to God's word and to trust what he says in his word? Lastly, how should we respond in those tense, dark times with faithfulness to God? This is what it looks like to truly have faith in God, 
Do you want to know if your faith is real? Look at your faithfulness. In other words, faith is always demonstrated in faithfulness. Trust in God is always proved by obedience to God. If we love God, we will keep his commandments. If we believe God's ways are true and best, we will be faithful to cling to them. Now, obviously, we all fail in many ways. But the question is, when we fail, like God's people clearly had in the book of Ruth, will we be willing to turn back to God, to find mercy and grace and help in our time of need? If we don't, and if we turn away from God and we run towards the temptation and we give in to the temptation, the darkness of life forces us to see this next. Listen, that temptation that leads to tragedy. The temptation that leads to tragedy. And here, times are tough. Food is scarce. They've moved their family, which must have been so incredibly difficult. They're in enemy territory, which would bring its own unique strain on life. But then notice this. In just one verse, we get devastating news. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. Sometimes in Scripture, we're told the reason behind a particular person's death Maybe they die of old age or they die of some kind of disease or sickness. Sometimes we're told that people die because of the judgment of God upon them. But here, there's silence. We don't know definitively why Elimelech has died. And that's a great reminder. Listen, we don't always know the reasons in specific cases for death. But listen, we do know what the Bible says about death in general. You see, this is a striking reminder about the the, the nature of death and our theology of death that needs to be brought to the forefront of our minds more often than it is. Death is an intruder, the Bible says. Death is an enemy that we all face. Death is the result of sin entering the world. It's a consequence of sin. In one sense, death is natural because we see it all the time, but we need to be reminded every time we see death that this is not natural. This is not the way it was supposed to be. Death is a consequence of rebelling against God. It is, in a sense, broadly speaking, a judgment uh, uh, against humanity for our rebellion against God. This is a great reminder that sin is the great enemy that we all face. Both his sin and his death have consequences for his family in this story. It's a powerful reminder that sin is not secluded. His death and his decision to go into enemy territory and turn his back on God has now left Naomi with her two sons helpless in this enemy territory. What we see here is that she's widowed, which is almost like a death sentence in this culture. Her life is going to be very difficult from this point on, if it wasn't difficult enough already. But this is a powerful reminder, listen, that our sin is not quarantined. There's no such thing as self-isolation when it comes to sin. And as much as we want to think that our sin only impacts us, what we need to be reminded of so very often is that our sin impacts those around us, and more often than not, those who are closest to us. This is a powerful, listen, reminder for maybe some of you who are fathers there, striving to lead your families well. And we need to take notes on how to not be like Elimelech here on how to actually lead our family as if God truly is our king, to lead them in the word of God, in the truth of Jesus Christ, to strive to point our our family to the glory of God in everything we say and everything we do. Sin always impacts others. It's possible, by the way, that today you are suffering because of sin. In fact, it's guaranteed that if you're experiencing suffering today, you just need to know this, theologically speaking, um, your suffering is a result of sin. Sin that has invaded the world, sin that has broken the world, sin that has cursed the world. But maybe today you're suffering not just because of sin generally, but because of your own personal sin. It's possible today that you are suffering in incredible ways and that you're finding yourself in darkness right now in this moment because of your own personal decisions. 
that you've given in to temptation, you've turned your back on God, and you've run towards God's substitutes, and you've indulged yourself in sinful living, and you're finding now that the consequences were greater than you anticipated. But it's also possible today, listen, I want to I wanna speak to some of you here today. Some of you find yourselves suffering and in darkness because of sin that's been committed against you. Maybe you're like Elimelech's children who were dragged along into sin. Maybe you've been sinned against in some really horrendous ways and your life feels like it's broken and all you see is darkness in front of you and you're beginning to wonder if there's ever going to be light. Wherever you find yourself today, if you're in darkness at all, I want to give you hope. The story doesn't end here. But you need to see something here too. All suffering is the result of sin. All suffering is the result of sin. And if we choose to sin, we choose to suffer. We say this often around our church. Regardless of of the darkness you find yourself in, I want to encourage you to hang in there. And, And especially if you've come to this story today feeling like you're in darkness, it's not the end of this story, and it doesn't have to be the end of your story. Naomi's life begins to completely unravel in these moments. Her husband dies, but it doesn't end there. Before it gets better, it actually gets far worse. Look at this in verses 4 and 5. Then her sons, um, they took Moabite wives, which is a problem in and of itself. We read the name of the wives. One of them was Orpah, and the other is named Ruth. And they live there. They continue to live in Moab for another 10 years out of the promised land. And notice this, and both Malon and Killian died so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. I mean, this is as bleak as it gets. She's not just being stretched anymore. I mean, the rubber band has snapped. Life has completely fallen apart. Everything is unraveling at the seams. She's widowed in a foreign land, and there seems to be a ray of hope because she has her two sons. Her two sons could help protect her and provide for her. Certainly, they could provide comfort and care. The two sons marry. And again, there's a ray of hope. Maybe the family line will continue. A family line in this time was everything. It established you in the community. It gave you a sense of hope and a purpose and a future. And yet, what we find out here is they both marry Moabite women, and then tragically, we don't know how, both sons die, and their wives are left barren. The hope of a future line is tragically erased. Both sons die, the place where she might find some kind of comfort and some kind of peace in the midst of her mourning and sorrow and difficulty in life. And now she's left with two daughter-in-laws. All of them in this culture would have been struggling now in life in incredible ways. You see, this is such a bleak and hopeless scenario. It's tragic. And it's almost shocking. You know, we read in these few verses, I mean, what takes us 10 seconds happens over the course of 10 years. It almost seems on the part of the author to be so blunt and abrasive. And yet, isn't that the way life is sometimes? I mean, one moment everything feels like it's going well, everything seems good, you feel like you're on top of the world, and then another moment everything's crumbling and falling to pieces. Life can feel so blunt and so abrasive. This little book is going to give us perspective on this when we feel so lost and in so much pain and sorrow, when we experience so much confusion, what we're going to see is that God is still there. And those who face tragedy, which will be all of us at some point, will be left looking back and asking these kinds of questions in the midst of the darkness. God, where are you? God, why are you allowing this? Why is this happening to me? Is there ever going to be any light in the midst of this darkness? Surely, Ruth and Naomi and Orpah felt this in this moment, the weight of all of these circumstances crashing in upon them. They're experiencing great tragedy. Even at the end of this chapter, Ruth is going to talk about her own life in stark terms. She's going to see God in verse 20 as her enemy, as if God's turned his back on her. Some theologians call this the dark side of providence. 
You know, when you can't see and you simply don't know all that's going on, it's kind of like the dark side of the moon. Everything is black. It feels like there's no way out. And again, maybe that's you right now, this morning. Maybe you've tuned in online to this service and you listened to the songs that were being sung, but your heart felt so distant from them. Maybe for some of you, the darkness is so thick you couldn't sing this morning. You knew there were people who are worshiping their hearts out with great passion and fervency, but, but your heart feels so much despair and sorrow, and you've been suffering so deeply to even read the words was painful and hard. Maybe you're wondering this morning, is there any hope for me? God, is there going to be any way I can get out of these circumstances? God, is there any way that you could take a sinner like me and still forgive me and offer me help and hope? Is God here in the darkness? What is God doing? But to answer these questions, we need a different vantage point. You see, we're so often looking from our own perspective And so often we're stuck at the beginning of the story, and yet we need to to see God's vantage point. God knows the beginning and the end, and in this story, we actually get to know the end. And some of you have read already the story or you're familiar with it, and you know that this story is a story that's not filled completely with darkness. It's filled with great hope, with great light. And when we get God's perspective, we see that even in the darkness, we can experience this, finally, tragedy that leads to triumph. That God loves to take brokenness and make something beautiful. And even in the bad things, God is working together for our good. We'll see this story that Naomi, in Naomi, who in chapter 1 says this. She says, the Lord's hand has gone out against me, in verse 13. She describes herself almost as if God has become an enemy to her. And she describes herself in verse 20 and 21 as being empty and bitter. She says, don't call me pleasant. Don't call me Naomi. Call me empty and bitter because God has turned his back on me. By the end of the story, others are describing her as being blessed and redeemed and restored. The book of Ruth is a picture of God's sovereignty. It's a reminder that God is the the key player in human history in biblical in the biblical storyline but God is sovereign and the key player in your story you want to know what I love about the book of Ruth here God could have selected anybody to zero in on and he picks what seems at the beginning like some obscure family and he dives into their life and we we get a glimpse of their life listen it's a powerful reminder that as obscure as you may feel yourself to be God is sovereign over your story too he knows you personally and intimately and he cares deeply about you God has not left you. God has not forgotten about you. God still cares about you. It may feel or seem like God is silent. It may seem like his work is hidden from your sight. But from the vantage point of the end, we see that God is actually the master weaver. And in the midst of the darkness, we need to be reminded of of the words of Scripture, the promises of God, like Romans 8.28, that so many of you you are familiar with. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. We've seen this already in this service, right? For those who are called according to His purpose. That God is working in the midst of the darkness. God is actively at work in and through the difficulties and tragedies of our lives. Whether they're self-imposed or circumstantial, God is still at work and is sovereign in our lives. Have you ever seen a a tapestry? You know what I mean, right? A tapestry. Have you ever looked at the flip side of a tapestry? It's all mangled, and and the ends are all messy and frayed. It looks disjointed. It looks ugly and purposeless. But then you flip the backside of the tapestry over, and you see that the artist has created something beautiful, something that you couldn't see, something that was hidden from your sight. You see, God is the, the master weaver who is taking what seem to be frayed ends of our lives, disjointed and disconnected and confusing and ugly, 
But for those who trust in God, God is working all things together for our good. God is weaving a beautiful picture that is filled with purpose and intentionality and beauty. This is the story of Ruth and Naomi, and it's the story of the scriptures. They so often seem disjointed and chaotic and even tragic at times, but God will so often take what is tragic as we see it and he'll turn it into something triumphant. And you know, this famine, although it drove them away from God, we need to be reminded that this famine was intended to pull them back to God. This famine was intended to produce a hunger and a longing for God, a desire to be satisfied by God alone. This is so often the way that God uses tragedy in our lives. And we see this even through the famines in Scripture. It was during the time of Elijah that God used a famine to bring his people back to him. It was the same thing in the story of Joseph who suffered tragedy after tragedy at the hands of his wicked and evil brothers. And at the end of his life, remember what he says to his brothers? He looks at his brothers in the eye as he can see the end of the story, the vantage point of God. And he says, listen, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. And you know, in the story of Joseph, God uses a famine to save the sons of Jacob. And what's really interesting as we move to the New Testament, one of the things we see is the story of the prodigal son. The prodigal son who turns his back on his father. And he runs and he lives it up in the world. He indulges himself in, in everything the world has to offer. And isn't it interesting that in that story, God uses a famine to bring that prodigal son low and to turn him back so that he might walk back to the arms of the father. God loves to take tragedy and turn it into triumph. You see, it's so often tragedy that God is simply using to get our attention. He's saying, turn to me. And in moments of tragedy, we are intended by God to experience our humanities that, uh, humanity in a way that wakes us up to our reality. Tragedy is intended to help us. In fact, let me give you three ways, uh, four ways, excuse me, that tragedy is intended to help us. Tragedy is intended to help us embrace our human sinfulness. It's a reminder, again, that as we look at tragedy, that this is not the way it's supposed to be. It's a clue that wakes us up to the reality that we live in a world that is filled with brokenness and sin. Sin outside of us and sin within us. Tragedy is a reminder also, listen, that we need to embrace our human helplessness. That as we look at our, our, our dark circumstances or sin in our lives and the broken relationship that we've experienced with God, that, that we are humanly speaking helpless. We can't fix our problems. We are not sovereign over the smallest details of our lives. And tragedy is intended to help us embrace human hopelessness. God is trying to strip away all those things that we tend to put our hope in the things we think can save us, the things we think can bring us joy and satisfaction and delight. He wants to rip all of those things out of our hands because he wants us to embrace this, finally in the midst of tragedy, divine kindness. You see, this is going to be the story of Ruth and Naomi as they experience the divine kindness of God, as they they look at their, their human sinfulness and human helplessness and human hopelessness, but what they do is they turn back and they look up and they find divine kindness. That God is ready and waiting for all those who turn to him. And he wants to embrace them as a loving father, his children. This is the heart of Ruth. And this can be the heart of your story as well. This is what God is going to show us through this book. You know, I love, you know, in the darkness, we think, we think we're in control. We forget that God is in control. I love what Corey Ten Boom says. She says this, there is no panic in heaven. God has no problems, only plans. And this story is a part of God's grand plan of redemption. This is ultimately a story that points forward to the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
and it fits into the bigger picture of what God is doing to rescue humanity from their human sinfulness, from their human helplessness, and from their human hopelessness. You see, this points us ultimately to the divine kindness that we find in the gospel. We celebrated this last week, Easter weekend. The kindness of God where he looks upon us and he enters into our reality. And God sends his own son out of love for us, his creation. And Jesus Christ not only takes upon humanity, but he he marches willfully to the cross where he will be crucified and take upon himself the curse of sin, the wrath of God that we deserved for our sin. And what we see is what appears to be the greatest tragedy of all ends up three days later being the greatest triumph of all, where Jesus Christ rose from the grave victorious, triumphant over sin and death and Satan. And this is where we run to to find hope. In the midst of the darkness, we see that God has left for us a great life in the light of Jesus Christ. And Jesus' journey was not a journey to sorrow and tragedy, but ultimately it was a journey through sorrow and tragedy to bring triumph and joy to us. The book of Ruth is not said in the Old Testament simply as some neat, encouraging story for us to read. No, this is connected deeply to the whole salvation storyline of the Bible. And the tragedy of the barren womb at the beginning would be met with the triumph of the promised Messiah at the end. Because one of Naomi's ancestors would be the promised Messiah, Jesus Christ, in whom she would ultimately find her comfort, her peace, and her rest. You see, we need God's perspective. We need to learn to trust God's plan, not our plan. We need to look to his sovereignty, especially in the midst of, of our suffering. You see, through this story, we're going to learn many things that are so important for us to learn when it comes to a life of faith. We're going to learn that there will be times when God seems to be hidden from us, when God's hand seems to be hidden, when his voice seems to be silent in our lives, when darkness seems to have eclipsed the light. But what we'll see is that God is faithful that he will bring light in the darkness, he will take tragedy and turn it into triumph because that is who our God is and that is what our God does. We're going to learn that God will often do his best work in our darkest moments and that God is often working most powerfully when it appears that his voice is most silent so that in the end we'll be able to look back at our lives and we'll look back at all of human history and we'll see what appears to be all of these frazzled and frayed kind of plot lines of our lives all coming together like a good movie at the end when they all culminate and we look at it and we say, no way, and God's going to say, yes way. I told you I was always in control. I was always working everything together for your good and for my glory because you love me and I love you. We're going to learn that God has always been in control. That is who our God is and that is what our God does. And we're going to learn that God may not give us all the details about the circumstances of our lives. He's not always going to tell us why but he's always going to give us promises in the dark times to cling to. Our God is a promise maker and our God is a promise keeper. And for reasons that belong only to God, he doesn't always let us in on why he's doing what he's doing, but he always gives us promises to hold on to in the midst of the darkness. Lastly, though life seems to unravel, listen, listen carefully, loved ones, though your life may seem to be unraveling, even at this very moment, not one thread is wasted for those who trust in the Lord. He sees your life. He's at work even in the midst of the darkness. I love Psalm 56 says that he counts our tossings. He holds our tears in a bottle. In other words, God God knows the, the deepest, darkest despair that you may encounter. He knows the darkness intimately. 
And he cares so deeply about you. He loves you and he's not left or forsaken you in the midst of the darkness. And we need to learn that some questions in our lives may not be answered, but if we trust in him, we will see light even in the midst of the darkness. In the midst of this tragedy in Naomi's life, little did she know that her great ancestor would be Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the promised Messiah, the light of the world who would come into the darkness to rescue us. God has not left us without light in the darkness, but has given us the light of the life of his son, Jesus Christ. Grab hold of Jesus Christ. Cling to him with everything you have for all the promises of God find their yes and amen in Jesus. Father, thank you. Thank you that you are a good God. That God, you take what is tragic and you bring triumph. That God, you truly do bring light in the midst of the darkness. That Father, you have not left us without a hope in this world, but you have given us the light of the gospel of the glorious Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. And Father, I pray now that you would stir our hearts, that we might sing unto you, that you might receive praises from hearts that are filled with hope and life and light and Lord, thankfulness to you, our great God and King. We turn to you now, receive our praise in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Oh,
it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Keep light in the darkness, my God.